I honestly think, man, that the longer it takes to get in the arts, at least, maybe you could say the same in athletics, I'm not sure, but in the arts, I feel like the longer it takes you to get the spotlight on you, and the longer you spend down in the dumps, the better your shit's gonna be when it, when it finally does get, get uh, presented to the world. In the performance horse world, people who compete at an elite level don't usually climb to the top quickly. Like most achievements in life, it takes years of dedication, strong work ethic, and the right mindset to stick with the process and grind it out. As a former college athlete, I know this to be true, and I'd add that through it all, you have to genuinely love what you're doing. My passion for horses and my competitive nature makes me hungry for answers. So I've set out to discover the psychology behind success stories living the Western lifestyle to expand my awareness and apply what I've learned in my own life. This journey of discovery will be uncomfortable for me, but the reward will be unmeasurable. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. Presented by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. Hey guys, Mike Roberts, The Converse Cowboy Podcast. Sat down with Cor Blunt today, musician from Alberta, Canada. Really cool conversation with him. We talked about a number of things. We talked about where he got his start as a musician to some of the challenges that come up for those guys, you know, some unexpected things like COVID is probably the most obvious right now. And we definitely talked about that and and how those guys have adapted and moved forward. And and he's definitely a guy with the growth mindset. And you'll see that throughout the interview. Here's some of the things that he's done, some, some new routines that he's adopted. And just a glimpse into what life is like for Cor Blunt. So cool, man. I'm just, I'll dive into it, dude. Um, again, like, thank you for sharing your time with me. Um, yeah. I, I know you're a busy guy. So I dressed up for the occasion out of respect. I got the tuxedo on. Yeah, I see that. You clean your hat too. It's good. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what these guys are just saying. But um, man, let's just. I'm not as busy as I usually am. Yeah, let's talk about that, man. Like, how's life treating you? Um, well, I have mixed feelings about the whole situation because if it had happened to me at a different point in my album cycle, it hardly would have changed anything because when I'm, uh, when I'm writing music, I'm just kind of a hermit mostly anyway, but as it, as it happens, we, you know, it had been about four years since our last record and we just. I kind of redoubled my efforts. This is like our number eighth or ninth. And I kind of went through a slump for a few years. And then I kind of kind of got some wind in my sails and got excited. And the band got excited. So we put a ton of work into the record. And I wrote way more songs than usual. And we we uh you know put more work into the recording and rehearsed the shit out of it. And then we released it and uh we had, you know, got the van all fixed up and the stage banners bought and the photo shoots and the publicist hired, and we got one week into a seven-month tour and had to come home from Colorado. So so uh, two things. It's been a financial hit and it kind of, more importantly, it kind of sucks because we're really proud of the record and it's, it's doing okay, but it'd be better if we could tour it. But having said all that, if I can compartmentalize that part of it, it's been all right because I've been grinding at this music stuff my whole adult life, which I'm happy and happy about, but um, I, I'm the kind of person that doesn't really let myself take too many breaks. Yeah. Dad, dad kind of drilled that into me and you know how that goes. Yeah. But, uh, but it's kind of, I'm kind of looking at it. The first thing I did was that when I realized it was going to be a while, I didn't want to come out of this with just having sat on my ass for a year or something. So I decided early on, I was going to turn it into kind of a mandatory, what would you call it? A professional development sabbatical. So I've been, uh, taking guitar lessons and, and working on my, you know, people ask me why I'm taking guitar lessons, but it's kind of like a golf swing, you know, like you never really Tiger Woods still takes a coaching lesson once in a while, I imagine. But yeah. Yeah, so I'm working on that and I'm writing a ton of tunes and I'm uh, digging into kind of sharpening my musical tools that that I haven't had a chance. Because once you get on the tread, and I don't mean it in a bad way, but once you get into the cycle of releasing records, you you write the record, you record it, you tour the heck out of it. And by the time you're done, it's time to start writing again, just get into a loop, which is good. That's what you want. But but in terms of like, I've, I've been able to address some some kind of fundamental guitar technique stuff I've been tr- struggling with for years and working on my voice. And anyway, so that's the long and short of it, but you can ask me again next summer. I might be sick of the goddamn thing by then. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think that's, I mean, I think that's great. You know, um, 
we always have a choice, like the perception on which we view anything that happens in the, in the world, you know, and in our life. And a lot of things that happen are outside of our control. And most recently, I think everybody has felt the effects of that with COVID, you know, like COVID-19 is totally out of our control. But you can sit in your own misery and wonder why this shit's happening or um, you can choose to look through the lens like you're doing and look at it as an opportunity to grow, you know, where you are sitting at home and you're, you're focusing on your craft, whether you're writing or working on voice lessons or guitar, you know? Yeah. You know, one thing I've never been able to relate to is people when they say they're bored, I, I just don't have bored in my vocabulary because I've, I've got about six lifetimes with the stuff I want to do, you know, yeah. like whether it's learning right. other languages or books I want to read or books I want to write or, work on my artwork or you know about 10 different musical careers in my head and learn to rope better or all you know there's a million things right yeah yeah so anyway i just looking at it as some free time to to dig into some stuff so it's funny because yeah. it's funny because i was telling people that like summer is my busy time hey like fairs and rodeos and festivals that's kind of our our real busy time and uh <laughs> i was telling somebody that I, I couldn't remember the last time I had a full summer off at home and spend time on the ranch and stick around. But then it dawned on me about October, like shit, I haven't spent a winter home for a little, oh, <laughs> winter's a different story up here. Cause it socks in like, by about March, you've had enough of it. So yeah, I usually get to go to California or Texas two or three times in there and miss the cold. But uh, yeah, so we're, we're hunkered down for the long haul here up here. Yeah. Tell me about that. So I read a quote that you said, it says, the biggest reward of it all is getting to do what I love to do most for a living. And through my research, I learned that you really enjoy doing the live shows, right? Like that is yeah. what will get you up in the morning. So can you describe that feeling to me? So this show is all about mindset. And most recently, I'm really diving into like flow state, that, that state where just time disappears, you know, all worries disappear and you just get lost in the zone. So... Can you describe that feeling to me um, as far as getting up and playing those live shows? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty close. It doesn't always work out that way, but but on a good night, that's how it feels, yeah. Like, when you have a good night, you really, uh, and I mean, my band and I have been doing this long, long enough that we, you know, when you start out, you have some really, you bomb when you're a kid. But I mean, we've been doing it long enough. We, we seldom ever have a terrible gig, but, but uh you know, when you have an above average one, which is probably maybe a quarter or a third of them, yeah, you just lose yourself in it. Talk to me a little bit about like the pregame, like what go, like pull the curtain back, what goes on like backstage as far as like getting dialed in, mindset and things like that. Well, it's funny because up until yeah. recently, up until recently, there really hasn't been much of one. I have a beer and just bullshit, but, but it's funny because I've realized that you, you really want to get inside baseball here? Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the major problems I've had with my guitar playing over the years is, is, is tension. And it's, it's probably the same as sports or anything. It's like the more tension you have, the less freedom, freedom of motion you have and stuff like that. And it's playing shows can be pretty daunting. Even if, you know, it's, I've done it thousands of times. So it's not really scary, but it's just a lot of pressure because, because I'm not just playing guitar. I'm singing and I'm, you know, wondering if the audience likes the new song and which song yeah. should we next and how many tickets did they sell? And I think the sound sucks in here and you know, <laughs> whatever, right? There's a million things in your head. So yeah, I I started taking guitar lessons, like I said, at the beginning of COVID. And, I, you know, it started out just wanting to, you know, be a smoother, more fluid guitar player. But then it, it wasn't long before I realized and with, with the, the guitar guru i got he's kind of into um he's into like um techniques to to free your body of tension and just nothing nothing hippy dippy just just like trying to identify tension in your body same as you would if you're an athlete i guess and yeah, sure. I realized that i'm taking a lot of tension into the shows so i kind of i kind of uh made up my goal. we played about four or five like drive-in shows over the six seven months just those kind of weird socially distanced ones so i made up my goal at all those shows to to be super present and aware of the tension in my arms and stuff and and uh i was able to do it and it's much better playing that way so up until recently i didn't really have a routine but but for those shows i made i made sure i was <clears throat> like uh 
loose and, and playing guitar and, and deliberately not, you know, getting sidetracked bullshitting with people or drinking or anything. Like I, I deliberately, I, I can play a show in my sleep at this point and people probably don't know the difference, but my personal goal was to, was to find more freedom in my, in my upper body for, for, for the sake of my guitar playing and my singing, frankly. But um, it, it's really hard playing shows because you know, it's the same as public speaking, kind of. That's how I tell, relate to me, or the big game or whatever. But it's like, there's a certain amount of, you get keyed up for it, right? And so it's 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 hard sometimes to maintain a level of relaxation that is ideal for performing because there's just so much pressure and there's a thousand people and it's loud and, you know, it's yeah. chaos. Especially, you know, if you play in Carnegie Hall, I'm sure they've got it set up where there's a nice dressing room and relaxing music and some tea. But in my world, playing honky tonks, it's just chaos, right? right? And there's buddies you haven't seen and they're drunk and there's people backstage and it stinks and there's, all, you know, whatever. So it's you have to kind of make an effort to, to, find, <laughs> to find that kind of calm in the storm. But I found that it, I was able to and it really helped. So that's long story short. I recently sort of got into a routine. Yeah, so you can feel a difference though, right? Like you talked about freeing up tension like in your body, but also like where your mind goes, like do, do you feel like you freed up tension there? Because I have to think like when we're young, when we're starting out at anything new, like we don't know what we don't know. We just go do the shit really with no expectations. But like as your career has grown, like as the success has came to you, I'm sure those expectations grow like you're more worried about the sound like you said there's a thousand people you're worried about what what that they're thinking you know how do you mentally overcome that in a in a way to where you get back to like just do, focusing on doing what you love to do well it's kind of a, you kind of said it it's kind of a loop because really the way right. the, the answer is, is to focus on what you're doing and and like specifically on bodily tension and body awareness you know just in terms of it sounds kind of esoteric but it's not it's not really it's just it's just making sure that your your mind isn't elsewhere you're just thinking about okay are my shoulders free is my neck free and and actually I, I found a good tool is like there's certain things I can only play on guitar when I'm relaxed because if you start to tighten up you can't do certain things so that I've got two or three sort of rhythm things that I do that that's kind of like a a benchmark because if I if, if it's three minutes till stage time and I can play them, I know I'm relaxed. And if I'm having trouble, that's like a big it's like, oh shit, I gotta get my shit together here. Cause because <laughs> like if I can't play them, it's like a it's like a clear uh indicator that I'm not mentally relaxed. So yeah. yeah. It, it's funny because it, you're catching me at an interesting time because up until really up until this COVID, I, I really haven't thought about that stuff at all. And I've done it thousands of times and I just have a beer or six and just grab the guitar and go do it. But I, I'm finding that it's much more satisfying to like, like I'm really starting to value the time on stage in terms of using it as, as, as a tool for growth, I guess, as you, you call it. Like they say that about everything, like any kind of skill, whether a sport or an artistic endeavor, all that stuff really in some ways it's not about the actual thing. In some ways, if you look at it the right way, it's it's actually the whole thing is a vehicle for self-development, right? Yeah, for sure. Feedback loop, because the more, you know, you know, they say they say that ideally in the arts, you know, you do what you love and develop your develop your craft and get good at it. And and any kind of you know success you have with it's kind of a byproduct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really into like I'm never gonna be huge, and that's okay with me. Like I most of the people that are huge have different goals than I do. Like, like the guys in Nashville, I don't want to, you know, Chris Stapleton is an exception or whatever. There's a few exceptions, but for the most part, the mainstream commercial artists in all genres aren't always in it for the art. They're in it for, they're spending more time on the wardrobe and the Twitter and all that stuff. And that that's fine if that's your goal. But my, my goal, honestly, when I first got into music was to know, like, it's funny because when I was 16 or whatever and, and saw the first two or three live punk rock shows that blew my mind like the, and I'd never felt energy like that or a blues show or a rock show or whatever but you go you go to the show and you see the guy or girl on stage and you can tell within about 30 seconds like holy shit this person has got the magic right and yeah. and I always wondered what right from the day one is like I want to I want to whatever that guy feels like I want to be there 
And so, so my whole career and all the millions of hours I've put into songwriting and singing and playing guitar has, has all been geared towards becoming like developing what that headspace, I guess you, I didn't have that language when I was a kid, but, but yeah. I just want, I wanted to be that guy, you know? So, you know, and, and, and any, any sort of, you know, career highlights and acclaim you get ideally is kind of a, it's kind of a result of it as, as opposed to the end goal. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, a lot of that goes back to like social conditioning and, um, you know, growing up, we're taught to value the money, the fame, all of the shit, you know, and so that's kind of hardwired into us. So I think awareness is key to that. And really like going back to the process, going back to doing stuff for the fruit of the labor, you know, and like, like, well, you gotta love it. like I, I love spending four hours working on my guitar technique. Like when, you know, people have it in their head, oh, you got to practice for four hours, but I, I love it. That's, that's what I want to do. So, yeah, you look at it as an opportunity, like you get to do that. Not that you have to do that. Right. Yeah. It's fun. And, yeah. you know, as far as what you said about the value system and what your goals are and stuff, I'm not sure. I suspect we have similar backgrounds, but I, I have to credit my parents a lot for that because, you know, my dad kind of, your dad's, it's your dad's job to kick your ass when you're being a shithead, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Dad was kind of a, my parents were interesting. Dad was kind of a Renaissance cowboy. He was a, he was a pro bulldog up here and he was also a veterinarian and uh, had cattle and he was also a Western artist. He did watercolor stuff. Yeah. And, and he was kind of an amateur archaeologist. He had all kinds of stuff going on, but he he instilled into me at a very young age that, you know, go do stuff. You know, yeah. <laughs> it was actually funny because the first the first ten years of my musical career in my twenties, I was in a really heavy rock band. Right before I was writing Western music, yeah. I grew up pretty Western. But when I was about fourteen, fifteen, I heard you know Iron Maiden and all that stuff, and that <laughs> I, that was exotic to me. So, and I got to give my folks credit because they you know. <laughs> when my hair started getting longer and the music started getting louder, they did not understand it. Right. Totally yeah. alien. But I got to give them credit. They, they handled it about as good as they could. Like dad told me, he said, I don't know, I don't know what you're doing down there, but it's starting to sound like, you know what you're doing. So, when I was talking, <laughs> so, so yeah, he, uh, they were pretty cool about it. And then when I started writing Western music, of course they were overjoyed. <laughs> yeah. I bet they were. Talk to me about that. The smalls, like, getting into a rock band what how old were you 18 yeah so we got 19 it was great man. it was the best like we never made any money you know we had a cult following up here enough to we made just enough money to you know rent a house together and have keep the van on the road did you have was it like i'm gonna do this gig but i have this backup plan or did you just say man i'm gonna burn the boats and this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do music as a career no, I burned the boats. Like I had it in the back of my mind that I might eventually play a different style of music like I'm doing now. But in terms of the music, no, I committed pretty early. Like I went, I got a, I got a, I almost finished it. I'm not quite finished it, but I, I got most of it, a history anthropology degree behind me, but um, not that that's going to give me a job anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I pretty much committed pretty early. Like, I mean, you know, at any point I could have stopped, I suppose. But, yeah. uh, but no, it was, I was pretty committed. I was all in. And, and in the rock band, um, yeah, it was really cool. Cause we were doing a really like the, we were, it was a very underground kind of, uh, it wasn't punk rock music, but it was that kind of a, that kind of eat, like do it yourself, roll up your sleeves, independent underground kind of a thing. Yeah. Kind of like, kind of like it's, I've, discovered later that's like kind of like the dude did like he's totally different music obviously but that guy sold what he said a hundred thousand records out of, out of his pickup right yeah and he's written the I've, I've gotten to know the family pretty good and will his son has been doing his merchandise since he was 10 years old and he's told me all these stories about how those guys printed their own records and and uh chris's dad was the record producer so it was it was very parallel in, in that sense but yeah like a I found that the, the indie music scene, the skills that you, you know, when you're a rural kid, the skills you learn as a rural kid map onto that pretty good. Cause you know, when you're on the ranch or the farm, you just, something breaks, you fix it. Right. Yeah. Something 
Yeah. When you do it, you don't hire somebody, you do it. So, you know, we printed our own t-shirts and fixed our own van and made our own stage banner and wrote our own tunes and, you know, booked our own shows and did our own publicity. So it was, it was a good education in, uh, in the nitty gritty of the music business, but it was kind of interesting because, um, I've always viewed the music business as sort of there, there's there's two sort of tracks, right? Like in all genres, like there's people that, that try to get signed by a big record label. And this is true in pop and country and rock, whatever. Um, and then there's people who just just do it on their own. Right. And I know so many people, especially in the country world that, you know, tell me they're doing something and they're, I just see them three years later. And I said, How, how's that record coming? Oh, well, we made some demos, but we're waiting on the manager guy because he's talking to these label guys. And pretty soon five years ago, I'm buying them, done nothing, right? So I, I, I early on, I decided I didn't want to do that kind of bullshit. I, I, I wanted to just, you know, make a, re- I, I didn't care. I didn't care what the success level was going to be. Obviously you want to succeed, but the goal was I wanted to be able to look back and have a bunch of records that I made. And, and I wanted to, to have seen the world touring. And I, so right from the beginning, we didn't, we didn't wait around for labels or managers or any of that stuff. We just, we just uh, made our own records and just booked our own tour and went out and did it. Yeah. And the same was true from my, you know, when I started playing Western music, the same was true. I, uh, you know, the, the first two or three records I put out it's totally on my own. And, and I would much rather do that because for lots of reasons, number one, you learn how to do stuff on your own. You're not, you're not, um, I, I've always had a fear of, of being, um, what, uh, dependent on the music business to have a career. Cause I know a lot of people in the country world, I know them, like I hang out with them sometimes, but that if they don't get radio play on their single, they, the tour sucks. Like they, they don't, they're completely dependent on that machine. Right. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. And that keeps you chasing trends and crap like that. So I, I've just gone the other way and done my own thing and, and uh, built a long-term audience. Cause I mean, I don't get, I mean, I get satellite radio play and stuff like that, but I'm never going to be on mainstream radio and that's okay. Cause my people, I think they grow to, they've grown to, to trust that I'm doing what I love and I'm honest about it. Right. Right. And that, I'd rather have a long career you know, where I'm at than, than five years on the top of the charts and then be a has-been. Cause yeah. like my heroes are like Ledoux and Ian Tyson and the guys like that. They just do their own thing. Right. Yeah. You see that like with the guys, like the guys you just mentioned and like a Towns Van Zandt or a guy, Clark, John Prine, you know, um, Turnpike. What about those guys, man? Are they, are they back together? Are they playing or? Well, nobody's playing now, so I don't know. I yeah. I heard rumors that they were gonna get to get going again, but that was before COVID, so I don't know. Are you buddies with them? Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, really good buddies. I I don't really ask them about it too much. I don't like to put push them about that stuff. I, sure. I figure it'll happen if it's gonna happen. But um, no, I, they're one of my favorite bands. But back to what you're saying, I think you're that's where you're going with it. Like they do their own thing, right? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think. I think so many people, I know this was true for me, like, what is my purpose? I played baseball in college and like, I feel like I had the same level of commitment like you did to music. Like I knew without a doubt that was what I was supposed to be doing, playing baseball, you know, and then that came to an end and I went into this dark depression, you know, it's like, well, shit, what do I do now? I I was just trying to find my way. So for you to be able to find that at an early age, like, I'm envious of that, but how did you know, like, what was it that, was it just the passion that you had for music? Yeah, I just, I just, like, I just, nothing else seemed as important. Like yeah. the magic, like is not to overstate it, but when you see a really good live show, like a really good one, mm-hmm. when the band is awesome and everybody loves the stuff and it's like, that's about as close to religion as I get. Like, <laughs> that's awesome. It, and literally, I mean, that kind of is what primitive religion is like. It's like a group of people having a shared experience with drums beating and yeah. dancing and mob. I mean, it's it's a very primal, quasi spiritual thing, I think. And so, yeah, when I when I first saw the first handful of live shows that had that magic to them, I was like, this is where it's at. This is this is this is where the the juice is, you know. So I nothing else nothing else seemed as important to me at, at that time. What made you, what made you make the switch to Western? 
I kind of always viewed the rock band as like, I never really wanted to do it my whole life and I loved it and I love those guys and I'm really proud of it, but I, I've never really, I kind of think that, and I, I'm not judging anybody, but in my opinion, rock, rock and roll music is kind of a young man's game. Like yeah. it, it never really rings true to me when a 50 year old's singing about, you know, fighting the system and shit. It's like, okay, whatever, buddy. you're a millionaire. But yeah. And, and I always liked Marty Robbins and Johnny Horton and Willie and Waylon all from my, from when I was six years old, all the way, even our rock band, all like country music too, old school stuff. But um, I never really stopped liking it. And about halfway through the smalls, I guess I started getting serious about trying to write that kind of music. And I, the first two records I actually put out while I was in the, the rock band. Um, so it was kind of a dovetail kind of a thing. And then as it turns out, like the, the rock band kind of, reached a point where we sort of disintegrated there was we just we're all going in the same direction so by that time I just said okay and changed horses and just and I, and I already had two independent records so I just got real serious about it. I moved to Austin for a while and oh yeah and made, made my first sort of serious country record which is called five dollar bill and uh yeah I just kind of hit the ground running and and you know <laughs> it kind of um it's kind of a affirmation of you know how hard work pays off because in the in the rock band we were kind of a democracy it was like you know like the beatles like four of us everything was combined and we owned everything together it was all a combined effort but as in most sort of situations like that there's a couple of us that did most of the administrative work me and the guitar player yeah and that's fine different people have different skill sets but i did all of the promo stuff like i was the guy that did all i phoned all the newspapers and phoned all the radio outlets and and I did all that kind of I booked a lot of the shows so people knew me already so it was pretty cool because I was just able to immediately call up the same people and say hey I got a new band check out my new record so it was and at that time I was doing everything myself so it was it was kind of um all the work instead of the whole time I was doing all that extra work in the rock band it wasn't really planned but I had it in the back of my head that you know all this extra work will probably pay off at some point which it did so yeah Man, I'm curious. So, like, people may look at a core blonde and they think success just happens overnight, and now you're core blonde and you have nine albums and you do your thing. But I know there are challenges that come up or have came up along the way. How do you? I think last, last we spoke last week, and you mentioned living in a in a van for two years or something like that. So. Describe those times and like how you overcome that stuff, you know, I mean, because I think that has, you have to have a strong why to deal with that shit. Otherwise you'll just throw in the towel and fall, go on a backup plan. Well, yeah, you just said it. Like I, I didn't really care about all this stuff because I, I had the, the eye on the prize, the prize and the prize not being fame and fortune, the prize being getting to the point where I was really good at doing this shit for its own sake. The van stuff and, you know, living in, like <laughs> me and the rock band, we we lived in the same house in Vancouver for a while and then in Alberta. And we lived in crappy neighborhoods and had a crappy van. And we, we made just enough money that we gave each other like a tiny little salary enough to buy food and stuff. But, you know, none of that bothered me. I, I was cool that I liked it. I, th I thought it was real. Like, yeah. I think I told you on the phone, like all all my heroes, every time I'd read a biography, they that's part of the biography. So I figured uh, it's part of the deal. Yeah, there seems to be it. I honestly think, man, that the longer it takes to get in the arts, at least, maybe you could say the same in athletics, I'm not sure. But in the arts, I feel like the longer it takes you to get the spotlight on you and the longer you spend in the down in the dumps, the, the better your shit's going to be when it when it finally does get get uh, presented to the world. Because I think I think that grit and and all that tribulation and all that stuff it all it all finds its way into the art yeah and i actually i actually don't you know i've seen people who have overcome it and, and handle it well but people who get signed right away when they're 23 to a big record label and their the spotlights on them, you have no time to develop and, and more importantly you have no you have no privacy to develop because i mean if nobody knows you you can go go down all kinds of weird artistic blind alleys and try weird stuff out that works or doesn't work and you figure out your shit and you get a 
get a thing together that's you right but if you're in if you're in the spotlight right from day one i mean you just don't have you have no uh you have no obscurity to develop your your thing yeah it's, so you're you just don't have as much to say i've, I've always said the longer it takes for put for to put a microphone in front of you the more you got to say when it happens right oh dude i love it artistically speaking you know what i mean yeah yeah i love it um so how that being said, like, how do you keep that mindset? How do you keep that grind mindset once you've had some success? And now that that the light is on you, you know, when that happens, like, what would your advice be to somebody that's up and coming who just kind of got noticed, you know? Well, not to sound like a broken record, but it's not hard for me because I just love doing it. Right. Like I love yeah. writing new songs and I love working on my guitar playing. And, this, you know, I guess I would say, I actually just did a sort of a seminar for a college, a music college up here for an hour, like it was a Zoom thing. But every time I ran into a brick wall, I uh, I just work, I would go inside internal and work on my shit more. Like if yeah. if the show sucked or if you know if the record didn't turn out how we wanted it or if people didn't buy the record or if you know people didn't come to the show, whatever, I I would just say okay, go in go inward and work on the stuff more and like it's funny because the way the way that things are today with twitter and all that shit it, it it makes it harder and harder for people to go in to go inside themselves and spend time uh in within your inner inner life or in your own head or whatever you want to call it and that's really crucial for artists because i mean i mean i'm big on uniqueness right like i my whole my entire artistic self image is based on uh, trying to find my own voice and being unique, which goes back to the radio thing. Cause those guys are always kind of trying to chase each other in circles and trying to do the same stuff all the time. I, I, it was ingrained into me right from the beginning that you should do your own thing and, and find your own path and find your own voice eventually. And so, yeah, whenever I tell young people that, and not, not every kid's going to have the stomach for it because, you know, it's, if you don't love it, love it, love it. Like you said a minute ago, like it, you know, nine records and all this stuff. And it, it appears as though, you know, it probably appears as though I could do this from birth, but I totally couldn't. Like I, I spent, I, I'm the opposite of an overnight success. Every, everything that's happened with me and my band has been from hard work and, and internal struggle. So that's, if you're not up for that, you should probably get another, another gig. Yeah. And not everybody is, and that's cool. Not everybody, like, I mean, I'm probably more, and ask my girlfriend, I'm probably more selfish and and more uh, self-absorbed than, than some people are, because I'm just, you kind of have to be to do this. Yeah, yeah. It's just endless, like, it's endless work. And I don't mind, because I like the work, but if you don't like the work, you might as well do something else, because yeah. it's just too much. It's like, it's like, a, it's a complete, it, it's a complete life choice. Like, it totally if you're going to do the way I do it, like it's not necessarily like that. If you're just kind of messing around with it, or if you get lucky and win the radio lottery early on, it's different. But, but if you're really trying to pursue an artistic life, it's, it's, um, it's all encompassing. Yeah, man. I agree with everything you just said. So like for me, about two years ago, I got into the practice of meditation and you talked about going inward, you know, and really, I want to know, like, why do I think the way I do? Why do these fucked up thoughts just come, you know, and 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 really getting my mind still and in a still place. Um, I was in pharmaceutical sales for a little while, and uh, that's based off of what people think of you, you know, and so it somewhat bred some narcissism. Not some. I was sure enough narcissistic, you know, and so. Can you explain that? Like, what, how does. How does being in pharmaceuticals lead to narcissism? Yeah, so maybe not pharmaceutical specifically, but sales, right? Like wanting people to like me, wanting, you know, every office I go into, like I feel like I'm being judged. And really it was just a judgment on my part, you know? And so I feel like how we, how we judge ourselves is how we judge everybody. And so through meditation and through getting my mind still, I'm able to kind of navigate these thoughts and where they come from. And most of it was all me. You know, it was all from within. Um, and so I, I, I'm just saying that I agree with you and the fact that 
diving inward, you know, especially with COVID, like it was somewhat of a forced reflection for a lot of people. So I've, I've flirted with that stuff for my whole adult life. I kind of go through phases, you know, I don't uh, like I, when I get really into it, I, I envy those people who, who spend their whole life ex- examining because it's kind of endless too. Right. But, Oh yeah. But uh, certainly there's some insight to be gained there for sure. And you know, there's different, levels of it like the kind of the kind of um focus that i'm after when i'm working on my music isn't quite the same as the as the focus i'm after when i'm meditating because that's more of a i would say the stuff i'm doing when i'm working on music is is more of a a very uh aware what the goal is being very aware of your of your current state as opposed to a meditative thing where you're sort of trying to get way inside yourself into another state so there's a little different but there is a common the the calmness part of it and the, and the, the presence and the uh, self-awareness part is all of the same it's kind of all yeah. the same relax what came up through all of that and, and of course journaling is a big part I, I journal every single day and so i got to the point it's like i used to say like i don't give a shit what other people think you know but i really did and now i kind of shift that I, I say i'm okay with what anybody thinks like and really just align with what's true to me and if you're not like if you're not cool with it like that's fine like I, it doesn't bother me anymore you know yeah that's a tricky one cuz i mean every, all humans want to be liked cuz we're social animals right yeah but but you're right though a, there's a certain balance in there like in what i do I have to be able to do that. It's a, it's a requirement because there's no way you could step on stage and present somebody with a new song. I mean, I like it better when people like it, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's kind of a juxtaposition thing because the, in my world, the more, the more that you do your own thing, the more people do like it because people are attracted to that kind of, um, I'm not saying I have it all the time, but what you, what I'm aspiring to is having, a, having a, confident and unique thing to give people right well it's authentic right like that's what i hear when i hear your music it's it's just authenticity yeah well i try yeah that's that's what i'm shooting for i mean it's funny because i don't write a lot of the stuff i write is about family history and and you know my ancestors and our western culture and that kind of stuff but not everything like i got a song about grave diggers and i got a song about oil riggers and i got a song about military stuff a bunch of those which none of those are me but i think part of being a storyteller is 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 um telling someone else's story authentically that's what i do in those cases like my brother's an oil rigger and i got a buddy who's a grave digger and i got a <laughs> bunch of very friends so the uh the authenticity i, I think that a, a lot of the stuff is my own my own life or at least based on my own life and our way of life and culture and stuff but some of it isn't but i think the trick to it is presented in a way that you feel comfortable doing and, and, and also doing the work to, to make sure it's accurate. Like in my, in my particular job, words are important. Like people know, like if you wrote, if you were to sound about oil riggers and you just didn't get the terminology, right. They would just roll their eyes. Same as cowboy stuff. Right. If you don't know what you're talking and you've heard that, right. Oh yeah. For sure. about cowboy shit And they just don't, they clearly don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, they get the gun caliber wrong or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> But you got to do the work uh, in, in songwriting and storytelling to get the details right. And I, I have no military background at all, no one in my immediate family. But the songs that I write about that kind of stuff, I do a lot of work reading and, and talking to guys and making sure that I get it I get it right to honor their work, right? To make sure that it's I, – I wouldn't go and write a half-assed song about, about that stuff because I don't think that's cool at all. Like you have to do the work. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious to know that process – Corb, the songwriting process, like, can you set that scene? I know we spoke a little bit about it last week, but like, are you going to a certain spot? Are you, do you have any vices? Are you, are you tapping into some drugs, some alcohol, tobacco, like to get into that zone, to expand awareness? Like, how are you writing your songs? Uh, no, I don't really do that stuff. I mean, I do it other times, but not when I'm writing necessarily. <laughs> But for me, for me, the trick, the trick is the, the magic of it is I can't remember. I think we got into this when we were talking on the phone, but like the magic of it to me is that 
I get ideas all the time. Like I got a couple of today and, and um, whether it's a guitar riff or, or a, a couple of lines for a new song or just an idea for a song. And I think that happens to everybody. Like, I think everybody has an idea f- for a good book or a, a hey, what, or a, wouldn't it be great if they made a movie about this or, or hey, I got a, I got an idea for a song. I actually hear it all the time. Hey, I got an idea for a song. But the difference, <laughs> is, the difference is with with people who actually do that stuff is you you develop the habit of writing it down. So the process starts for me spontaneously. I can be fixing fence or driving or playing guitar or anything, and I'll come up with an idea for a song. And then I just I used to write it down. I put it in my phone, but. Uh, those that's that's the lightning in a bottle I, like i can't sit down with a blank page and just say okay i'm gonna write a song and start from zero it doesn't work for me i have to so when i sit down and do the work what happens is i sit down with a blank page but then i've got a whole list of ideas and so i just dive into those and start messing with those so you know it's the inspiration perspiration part like the inspiration part i don't know it could stop tomorrow but it never seems it's like magic right it's just just boom you get an idea for a song and that's really cool so you write it down and then the work starts it's i guess it starts with writing it down and and being disciplined enough to do that and then when it comes time to start working on it you just kind of open that folder up and start messing with stuff and and then i hardly ever write songs in an afternoon um i feel that's forced in most cases so usually i have six or eight or ten or twenty songs on the go and i'll um if i'm going to write for the afternoon i'll i'll uh i'll work on half a dozen of them and sort of polish them and they'll take months some songs take years for me to finish so when you say when you say right for the afternoon like how long will you sit will you say i'm going to set aside two hours or three hours how how long are you sitting down at in any given time i meant by best when i can just be flexible like i mean if i have to i can say okay i got a window from two to six i'm going to write but it doesn't always feel right like the best the best thing for me is if i have big chunks of time at home and if i want to you know, if I want to go for a ride and then come back and ride, I just kind of go with the flow. And I mean, I like doing it. So it's not like I have to force myself, but, I, you know, at any given moment, I might, it might not feel right. So I, I just, I just sort of um, uh, go with the flow. And then when I feel like doing it, you know, I'll push myself a little bit. If I know I got to get some work done, I'll say, okay, every day I'm going to write. And then if I'm into it, I can go for four or five hours. It just goes by a quick. Really? Or sometimes you get a wall and you say, screw it, I'm going to go get some fried chicken or something. <laughs> <laughs> I nerd out like on office supplies. What are you using like a, cert- a specific notebook or a specific pen? Well, I, I hate to say it, but I do a lot of my work just typing, right? At this point. Oh, really? On a computer? Yeah, just because it's so much easier because you don't lose it that way. It's, in, you know, it's in the cloud yeah. or, you know, it's easier to transport. But I do, I do some work uh, with a pencil. I, I like pencil. I like I like uh, having a notebook with a pencil rather than a pen for whatever reason, just because I like the feel of it. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, when I'm when I'm really trying to get into it, sometimes I'll if I'm stuck on something, sometimes I'll I'll write out what I got with the pencil, and I don't know, it jogs your brain kind of. Yeah, I got you. What comes first? Are you are you writing writing? And I'm sure you get this question a lot, but like, do you write it first and then comes the melody and the guitar, or do you? do both at the same time it kind of varies and i actually like it that way because i think i think as soon as you figure that you know how to write songs you don't know how to write songs anymore because as soon as you stop (laughs) as soon as it stops being difficult and kind of a psychological struggle then then i think your stuff starts to suck like i think that's part of the part and parcel of it is is the, the struggle of it and part of that is is the process is always different like uh, I, I want to say the majority of my tunes start with, like I said, just spontaneously, not even playing music, just running or riding or driving or whatever, cooking. And then I get like, I'll get a couple of lines that kind of have a rhythm to them that are the, ca- and they end up usually end up being the chorus or something because it's catchy, like yeah. a hook. And so I usually get some, like, you know, I wrote my new song on a $5 bill, you know, I'll get that chunk, right? Like a couple lines and I'll write that, I'll record it or write it down. And then, and then I kind of build it up from there. So I'll usually get a lyric with a rhythm to it and a melody kind of together. It kind of just come pops into my head 
in some kind of rough rough state and then then i kind of build it out from there i often what happens is you get a verse and a chorus and then you have the music for the verse then you just kind of fill in the, the some lyrics for the remaining verses and sort of but i try to i go out of my way to try to not have a format like i i try to mix up the style like we've got all kinds of stuff like we got folk and we got Waylon country rock and we got blues and we got you got some even you got some poetry right tattoos yeah. blues yeah yeah actually that's a good example like of trying to just trying to be always do do something different right because i was i was showing the guys because that's that's part of the process too i'll get the songs to the point where i can play them on the guitar and then i've sort of shown my guys and my band who are they've been with me forever and they're all really really quite talented and so they can go anywhere i want them to go whatever style but i was kind of stuck on that one i was showing it to them and i was reciting it i was like i'm not sure quite what to do with this thing and they said well, you should just do like because i've taken i've dragged them to the elko nevada poetry deal a lot of times the cowboy poetry gathering up there yeah and so they're like why don't you just do it why don't you just make it a poem so i was like shit that's a good idea i so, yeah. i saw the youtube video where you played that in a tattoo shop well somebody's yeah. getting the tattoo yeah <laughs> <laughs> that, was like, that was like two in the morning hammered <laughs> we were all hammered. we were all hammered were, were one of those guys were, were they one of the people you were singing about in the song uh no it's kind of a general well no i'm just saying like the 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 what you, i'm trying to think of how the lyric goes where you're talking about some ignorant ignorant tattoo oh. guy no nah, no nah, i just kind of they i was wondering if they'd get pissed off at me but they <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was after a show last year in Fort Worth, and somebody said, Hey, I got a tattoo appointment. I was like, at one in the morning, and she's like, Yeah, come on, let's go. So the whole crowd of us went down and they made me dig the guitar out. And I'm surprised the tattoo guys were cool with it because I was back behind the counter and the whole bit. But yeah, you know. Speaking of Fort Worth, man, when are you gonna be back there? Who knows when the smoke clears, I guess. Like it's pretty tough for us because we got quarantined for two weeks if we leave the country. So yeah. uh, I don't know. Like it's your guess is because mine. I, it's gonna be it's gonna be kind of weird because I don't think it's just gonna be like back to normal. Because I, I feel like with COVID, I I think some venues are gonna be okay with opening and some aren't, and 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 the audience too. Even even if the government and like everybody says it's okay, I think there's gonna be a certain segment of the audience that's probably a little more gun shy that, that's going to kind of wait longer before they come out and get sweaty in a, in a bar. Yeah. So I don't know what it's going to look like. It's going to be a mess, but hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you read a lot. I'm curious to know what books have you reread the most? I like rereading books. First of all, I, I like rereading books. I like, re I like rewatching movies and I like, listen to my favorite records i i'm getting to the point in my life where i'd almost rather re-watch something or reread something than take a chance on something new which is kind of <laughs> but there's something to be said for depth versus breadth too right like yeah. I, I like okay so the um okay there's a book called the source by james Mishner. it's about the history of of the holy of of israel and well and the land where israel is it kind of goes through time from pre, from prehistory all the way to the present I've read that a bunch. What was the name uh, of it, Corb? Source. Source, Source by James Mishner, yeah. And there's a Hunter Thompson book that I read every every four years when you guys have your election cycle. It's called Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail, 1972. Mm -hmm. it, covers, it covers the primary in 72 and when, when, um, when uh, McGovern won the Democratic primary and got beat by Nixon. He, uh, that's, a, that's a really fascinating book because like Hunter Thompson's well known for his Las Vegas book. Yeah. They, movie about which is fun and it's crazy and but but he's this book is a real i mean it's still a fun book to read but he's really really a gift he was really a gifted political writer so i read that because it's like a it's like an easy way to to refresh myself on american civics and you know government government processes or election process so that and then uh what else do i read um there's about three or four oh, i've read uh well, Lonesome Dove, right? Oh, yeah. I've never read it. Of course, I've seen it, but I've never read it. Oh, yeah. Read the book. It's worth it. It's fantastic. Okay. And uh, Yeah. And um, 
I've got a book. Uh, I got a book about a book on knots that I like a lot. What is it? Knots. Knots. Tying knots. Really? Dude, I would. I want to get better at tying knots. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm writing it down. Yeah, man. Knots are the best. I sit in the back of the van and just tie knots sometimes when we're driving. <laughs> got a friend, cowboy friend. He's like, if you don't know how to tie a knot, tie a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's kind of my met. That's that's the extent of my knot tying abilities. Yeah, there's a good one called uh what's it called? I'll text it to you, but it's kind of the it's well, it's almost too much. It's about that thick and it's it's just got endless stuff. But you just what you need to do is get like uh, the 20 most popular or useful knots, like the good ones. You really yeah. only, you really only need to know eight or ten or whatever. Yeah. The ones that I see other people tie and stuff up with, and I'm like, son of a bitch, how do you do that? <laughs> and those yeah. Those, yeah. Bull and, a bull, I was I had a I had a bull and a bull line hammered into my head by my dad when I was a kid for for horses. Um, that's a good one because you can pull on it as much as you want. It never gets tight. You can always, you can yeah. always. Undo it. Yeah. And uh, the trucker's hitch is awesome. You know what trucker's hitch? I've is? heard of it. Yeah, I don't know it though. It allows you to, you know how you use a, a, a ratchet strap on a load on a truck or something. Yeah. It, it allows you to do that with a rope. Like it, it allows you because you know when you're trying to tie down a tarp with a rope and, you, and then you pull it tight and then you're trying to mess with it on the anchor point. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, what you do is it comes down to the anchor point and then you make a loop in the in the part that's coming over and kind of you can pull it down tight like this it's, yeah yeah tie and hay down and stuff right oh yeah super useful and uh there's one called a, uh i think it's called a sheep shank and it temporarily shortens a rope it's cool and, it, <laughs> and, it just, and then it just when you take the tension off it just falls apart look up sheep shank that's a good one yeah hell yeah we're off, in the, we're off in the weeds now. <laughs> these are uh, these are life skills that I should have learned a long time ago. Well, you know what's funny about you're talking about authentic writing. It's funny because a lot of a lot of times, um, whatever I happen to be like, I'm lucky because I'm not I'm not in the radio box where I got to write about stupid love songs all the time. So yeah. it, it often turns out that what I'm whatever I'm into at the time ends up in a song, like uh, you know. When I was doing rentals on my house, I wrote one about being a shitty carpenter. Or if I'm reading a lot about, uh, you know, war, ba battle, battlefield books, I'll write a military history song. And I, what my point is, I'm pretty sure that eventually I'm going to write a knot song. I think you should. <laughs> I think you should. I'm curious to know how many of those songs are sitting in a notebook that either haven't been finished or, or have never been heard. Well, hundreds. Well, m hundreds of chunks, you know. Yeah. Usually, usually for me, different people do it different ways. I know I know people that just have a volume thing with it, like the, they're a volume approach where they just write so, a whole bunch of songs. But my process is more granular. So if I get to the point where I'm not feeling it, I don't bother finishing it. I, I only work because it takes me so long to finish one. I put so much work into them that they kind of weed themselves out along the way. So I have hundreds and hundreds of chunks you know, pieces of wreckage on the highway, but I don't have a whole bunch of finished songs that are yeah. in the in the can because if I finish them, they're usually what I consider good because I if they're not, they wouldn't have got that far. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me this: is there is there one that you were like? I'm gonna ask this two ways. Like, is there one you're like you put out but you didn't have? Like, is there a time where you're like, man, this is the deal. Like this, this song is legit. And then it just flops and then vice versa. Is there, I, I hesitate to say it cause you're not going to put it out if you're like, yeah, it's not that good, but it like exceeded your expectation. You know what I mean? In um, what? Like okay. as far as like ratings or as far as like, po like people resonating oh, yeah. with that song. Oh yeah. 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 That happens all the time. Like I can never pick, I can never pick. I mean, we don't really have singles in my world, but you know, for yeah. lack of a term, I can never, really, I can never hardly pick the singles. Sometimes, <laughs> but like sometimes, you put out the record and you're sure this one's going to be the popular one, and there's track number eight is like what everyone wants to hear. So, yeah, yeah. like I definitely had songs that, 
like there's different i was asking about the metric because i mean the, what you're what scale you're talking about because it's it's there's different ones like there's how i feel about it and then there's audience reception which are not always related and there's there's one or two that that i'm really proud of because when i'm writing a tune i have a i usually have a feeling i'm trying to get across and more often than not it morphs into something else and, and goes a different way and that's a happy accident and it turns out cool and that's great and i like it in the end but every once in a while I'll write one and I, I'm able to maintain that feeling and capture it in the song just how I wanted it, like just so. And I got a couple like that, that I'm like, this is for me, it's just perfect. And then no one gives a shit. <laughs> <laughs> There's a song called uh, Game in Town Like This. It's about it's about card playing and and, and uh, gambling. And, and I perfectly capture in terms of my judgment, I, I perfectly captured what I was going for. And no one really seems to give a shit about that tune. <laughs> I love it. Some people do. It has a very narrow audience in, in, with poker players, but but I was really proud of that one. And no one really, and that's okay. That's cool. But then I'll write something kind of thing that's kind of catchy, but it's not you know what I'd consider my greatest contribution to humanity. And then people will love it, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Everything is better with some cows around. You know that it's one. It's so catchy, dude. It's. <laughs> I mean, I like that one, but it's like, it's not exactly, oh, I guess it's accurate. I mean, <laughs> it captures the tragic comedy of animal husbandry, right? Yeah. Yeah. What about this? I've got, I've got one more somewhat serious question. Then I'll roll into, we, I, I sent out a deal on Instagram today and got some questions from the audience. So I'll get into those, but like, do you ever, like when you sit down to write, the resistance, do you ever have like writer's block or like resistance to staying and doing the work um, for a, like a writing session? Oh, yeah. Yep. How, what are you doing like in, in those situations? How are you overcoming that? Well. Or how do you get out of your own way, I guess, is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. Like with, it's a little different with art than it is with like uh, stacking hay or maybe even working out and stuff. Because with art. I, I've always I've found that it doesn't do much good to force it. I just do something yeah. else. Well, I'll you know I'll work on something in my garage, or I'll read a book, or watch a movie, or just I just I just don't do it. Like I mean, there's a certain amount of discipline involved because I I know if I got to make a record in two months, I got to get get to work. But usually, sometime in the day, I'm going to enjoy doing it. And so if I if I decide I'm going to sit down at if I have a plan to sit down in the morning and write and it's just not, not feeling it, I'll just, I'll just leave it alone and go do something else and come back in three hours and then I'm into it. Like, it's not quite the same as I, I follow Jocko's stuff. Right. And he's yeah. like, like, no matter what, get up at five and do your workout, you know, yeah. <laughs> which, which makes sense if you're working out or if you're trying to, to, to get a job done like that. But with, with art, like I could kind of see that maybe with guitar playing, if I'm working on, if I'm working on technique, then yeah, yeah. do the work, get it done. But when it, when it comes to writing, different people have different approaches. Sometimes I'll just sit there and do it anyway, but more often than not, it's not productive. It's better yeah. just, it's better just to leave it alone and come back to it. Yeah. I was just curious. I, I've uh, read a book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, and that whole thing is just about resistance and overcoming resistance as it relates, you know, to writing or art or whatever it may be that you're doing. Yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a master procrastinator for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what he talks about. Like procrastination is a is a form of fear in a way. Um, 100%. Yeah. And you know, I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk that back a little bit. Because sometimes, okay, I gotta, I'm going to get more granular and clarify. If I, if I get playing and I'm, I've been doing it for 20 minutes or half an hour, it's just not working it, then I'll put it down. I'll put the guitar down and do something else. But back to the Jocko thing, that's actually true in terms of sitting down and getting the goddamn thing in your hands because I'll dick around for two hours. Yeah. But as soon as I get the guitar in my hands, most of the time it's fun. And it's like, oh, I should... Yeah, it's great. What am I? What was I scared of? But it's like you get all that shit built up about, oh, I got to do this and I got to do that, and yeah. I need to write songs, I need to get better at guitar playing. All that stuff builds up, and then you get there's a fear that builds up. But um, so he's, I, I, I do subscribe to the 
discipline of, of sitting down and starting. Yeah. But when it comes to writing, if you sit down and start and it doesn't work, then back off. But yeah, uh, yeah that's, does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. Like I, I, uh, I, I either heard Guy Clark say this in, inter- in an interview, I read it somewhere, but he said half the battle is just showing up. It's true. Yeah. And if you do it every day, even if, even if you get nothing for two or three days in a row, if you, if you commit to getting the, the guitar in your hands and, and trying, then, then something's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. I'm going to get into some audience questions real quick. There's just a couple. Hey, I want to ask you something before we get to that. Yeah, brother. You know, I, I always wondered, like I, there's been times, there's been a couple of times in my life where I've kind of considered maybe just stopping and doing something else, but it's, it's, it's so difficult because my entire self identity and stuff since I was 15 has been a musician. So if I wasn't a musician, I would, I, I'd kind of be lost. I mean, I'd figure it out, I guess, but I wanted to ask you about sports because musicians have the advantage of, you know, you know, what my comments about rock music, notwithstanding, like, you know, Willie Nelson's 85 and still playing, right. Ian Tyson's 87. He's still playing. I barring, yeah. barring the unforeseen, I, plan to be playing my whole life and you can do that if you play this kind of music so what was that like when you spend all that energy and all that time and and become self-identified with playing ball and then you just was that a major did you have to go through some dark times to figure out who you were after that yeah for sure I was at man it's I was journaling about that today and like what came up for me like at the end of every season I would go into like sports is by definition a young man's game most of the time in most things right yeah yeah for sure but like after at the end of every season I would have like this mild depression because I'm away from the locker room I'm away from comp- competing you know that's like all I knew at that time from when I was 5 through college and so but next season would come around and it was all good and then I'd do it again at the end of that year I'd leave college I'd be depressed and I'd come back and I'd play again well there was a year when they were like your shit ain't good enough to play anymore you know like thanks, but you got to move on. And so, yeah, it was real dark, man. Like I didn't know what to do. And I was trying to find my purpose, trying to figure it out. And it took me a long time. Like I, I got into sales because of the money, you know? And so I started, it was like, how can I make the most amount of money and do the least amount of work, you know? And so I started setting these monetary goals and, and like, I'd get to, I'd get to this monetary level and I'd hit it. And then, uh, still wasn't happy, you know, and I kept doing this thing. And so what I realized, I had the money, I mean, relatively speaking, Corb, like I had uh, six figures, you know, in pharmaceutical sales, I had the pretty wife, had the big house, still wasn't happy. And so after we separated it, uh, I had a, like, that was the, I don't want to say rock bottom, you never know what rock bottom is. But it made me do a lot of thinking, a lot of soul search and inner work. And what I finally realized was there is no destination. Like the journey is the destination. So to hear you say everything that you said about your journey and the love of doing it, like you don't do it for the money. You're not doing it for the fame. Like, man, that really resonates with me. And for me, it's like a constant, I have to stay uh, consciously aware of that. You know, now today, um, I'm a real estate investor and so really enjoy doing that, you know? And so it's about having that mindset, man, I get to go do this every day. I get to do this show, you know, like there's a lot of resistance that comes with the show and fears and overcoming ego and all that shit. Um, so I know that's a long answer to your question, but, um, yeah, it's like find a way like that. That's all I know. Like figure it out, you know, like not making excuses, but figure it out what you do because i mean you're only on the planet for 80 years or whatever and you know you gotta you might as well make it fun yeah and so that's the thing for me now like what's my why i want to experience life like i want to sit down with people like core blunt i want to tap into your mindset and really understand why you do what you do how you do what you do you know what i mean yeah no i've always wondered about 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 sports that way because because not only you know there's a there's a you know those 30 for 30 espn deals yeah, there's a really good one called Broke, and it's about the epidemic of football and basketball players that that leave the league broke or in debt, even like yeah. you know. And and not only that, maybe they got a bad knee or they've been concussed. But but the, to me, the biggest thing would be and 
they got no, well, not, not all of them, but off in many cases, they have no life skills because since they were 14, it was just basketball, basketball, basketball. And not only that, the biggest thing would be nobody gives a shit about them anymore, right? That's it, dude. That was a big thing. Yeah, like even I wasn't on the professional level, but in college, like, yeah, my ego, like, you pretty much could do whatever you wanted, you know, like you get girls, you get grades, you get like a lot of things come with it. And so, yeah, like walking away from that, it's like you're, you become a nobody really, you know, at least that was the bullshit stories I was making up in my head. Certainly a big adjustment, huh? For sure. Yeah. You know what you said about the locker room? When I'm, the things that I miss now, like about not touring, like the good side is I get to play guitar lots, which I'm enjoying. But the two things, the two things about, um, not being able to tour, number one, is just the communion of playing the live show, which I love. Like I said, that's the whole reason I do it. So I miss that. But number two is is the locker room part, like you said, like the guys in the van. Yeah. And you yeah. know, you don't you don't think it at the time because it's like, oh God, Wendy's again or whatever. How many hours? <laughs> how many hours are we driving today? But then you get home and it's like, shit, I love those guys. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like uh that it's like that uh gang of guys going down the road just talking shit in the van it's great i wanted to ask you about that like road life are y'all in like a like a tour bus so uh it depends on the size of the tour we have um i bought one of those uh ford transit vans it's like a it's like a benz uh, uh sprinter kind of deal you know yeah it's a tall yeah. roof and um we've kind of converted that into like a kind of a comfortable little home on the road so so yeah we've got some form of of uh place to go yeah bus tour having a bus it doesn't always make economic sense but like depending on the size of the tour but that's that makes life a lot easier because it's like you've always got a place to go and you and it's uh the way the way that lifestyle works too is that on a bus tour like uh you play a show drink some beer crash in the van and three or four in the morning the driver gets up and drives you seven hours to the next place and then you wake up and you're in the new place and you've got the whole day to yourself in a van tour you stay in a hotel and then you get up at nine or sometimes 11 and spend the bulk the, the best part of the day in the van and then you show up at sound check at five and that's your day so so the bus is nice because because you can actually have your day as long as you can some guys can't sleep well on the bus but you get used to it but basically you sleep through the drive and then you wake up and you're in <laughs> Hell yeah! I was listening to an interview that uh, Sturgill did with uh, Joe Rogan, and he talked about that. Like that was his one of his favorite parts is just being on the bus. Yeah, man, it's great. It's like, uh, I mean, assuming you like the guys in your band, I, uh, me and my guys are pretty close. We're like brothers, so it's yeah, it's it's the best. Yeah, which that's almost unheard of, right? To be together as long as y'all have been, have y'all never split up? Rare, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, what do they say? It's like a four-way marriage with no sex. <laughs> Hopefully, most nights. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how much beer you have. No, but it's, uh, no, we're like a family. I, it's It kind of feels like, to me, I again, back to what I said at the beginning, when I was a kid and I, I was into Willie or Merle or or the, the rock bands I was into, the ones I was into were the guys that were a unit, you know, and they, and they, I just always wanted that to have like have a group of guys and go do the thing and show up in Albuquerque one night and Seattle the next night and Paris, France the next week and just see the yeah. world. It's a great way to see the world. It actually, it's a, it's a fantastic way to see the world because people always want to show you cool stuff, right? Yeah. Like people show us, show us their, take us out to their ranches or two in the morning and take you to the cool after hours club or fill yeah. in the blank. Cool. You can see you see a you see a really uh, authentic part of the wherever you are that not every tourist gets to see. Yeah, I bet. How many stops we all make in a given year outside of COVID? But uh, probably on average, maybe on a heavy year, maybe play two hundred nights a year. But on average, if on the long, long, long term, probably average one fifty. Dang, dude! Really? Yeah. Holy shit. I'd say probably if you averaged out the last 15 years, I'd guess we'd probably play maybe between 120 and 150 shows. We generally, roughly speaking, spend about half the time on the road. Dude, you've seen some shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Like, I've, I miss another thing that kind of is tough about COVID is that 
I've got friends all over the place that I only see when I tour, right? So uh, I've got friends all through the American West and lots of buddies in Texas. Where are you at? I'm in Louisiana. Okay. Oh, you told me that. Yeah. But yeah, I got buddies all over the place. So I, unless I'm touring, I don't get to see them once a year. So if you ever find yourself this way, my man, you got to holler at me. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You ready to answer some audience questions? Yep. This is from James. He says, would love to know if S Lazy H is biographical or sem semi-biographical. So much of his stuff is written around real people and real events in his life. I'd be interested to know if this is one of those songs. Either way, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, no, that I get asked that a lot. And 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 happily, it's not a true story. It's well, it's true in the sense that it happens all the time, but right losing you know family disputes over ranches and stuff and losing them but but no that particular story all all the details in the story are about you know you know my truck got stuck song dude that song that song gets stuck in my head yeah i know that song that is a true story but my point is <laughs> you know there's this there's the line about holdman didn't have anything better to do but ranch so Holdman's, my, he's my oldest buddy we, my dad my dad was his dad's bet we go back to childhood anyway he Hit, that's hit, all the details in that song are around him. Like his, their family brand is the S I Z H, and he had a sister that went out east to go to school, and he was a, he was going to take pilot. He was he took pilot lessons and was going to fly planes, but he ended up running the ranch. So all those details are around my buddy, but that has that didn't happen to him. I just used it as a setting. I got you. I always tell people we're keeping a close eye on his sister, though. <laughs> <laughs> She's cool. <laughs> But yeah, that's a good question. It's true in the sense that it happens way too often, but but the details oh, yeah. and the details in that song are are accurate, but but the actual story didn't happen. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. All right. From McKenzie. I think a lot of people would like to hear some of the practice side of how he's surviving in the music industry. With the profit margin of sales being down so much now that everybody is streaming music and no live shows. How is he keeping his head above water? Well, good question. I, I'm fortunate that I've been doing it long enough. I get, you know, I get uh, some some regular income, at least to keep the lights on from royalty stuff, royalties and that kind of thing. But it isn't it isn't pretty. <laughs> yeah, no, I lost a lot of money because because uh, we had like like we hadn't played any serious tours for for quite a while because we've been spending so much time on the record and we we're like, well, it's okay. We'll wait and we'll get it all back on the big tour and then the big tour didn't happen. So. Yeah. It's funny because um, about 15 years ago when Napster happened and all the, you know, the digital revolution in music that really, it really turned, disrupted the music business. Yeah. And I got asked a lot at the time how it affected me. And honestly, my answer was always that it didn't affect me that much, like a little bit, but most, most of my, the bulk of my income is from live shows. And at the time I was like, and that's not going away. So <laughs> I guess I jinxed it. But in normal times, the, my point was that whether you're on the radio or whether you're selling records or whatever format is current, and whether you're making money from that or not, I think people will always want to go into a room and hear somebody sing songs to them face to face. You know, mm -hmm. there's just that energy, that, that magical energy that you can't get anywhere else. So so, you know, barring stupid bullshit like COVID, I mean, that's that's kind of an eternal thing. So no matter what the technology is doing, that's not going to really change. Yeah. So, yeah. And luckily, that's what I like to do. Like some people, some people make records and then they tour to support the record. But I'm the opposite. I, I make records so that I can tour. I, yeah. Touring touring and playing live is is what it's all about for me. D describe that real quick. Like, how is that? Like, you, you put this album together, you spend hours days weeks months writing this this stuff and then you get to go play it live for the first time like how is that the first time on stage dropping your new stuff it's awesome it's fun it's exciting because and you know the way that it works like often you know a third of the songs on the new record we've been playing live because you know you know i i write them over time and so if we have a new one we'll play it at the show whether we've recorded it or not to so uh -huh. in fact in fact, that's an excellent way to get feedback on, oh, this is too long or it's too slow or we need to make a guitar solo, some, you know, stuff like that. So playing the songs live is a really good way to, to uh, stress, stress test them. Yeah. Test them. Um, but yeah, like the first time you play a new song, especially 
there's lots of situations where maybe I haven't been to Minnesota in three years and, you know, the record has come out in the meantime and people have become familiar with the record in that region, but we haven't been there for a while. So that's always really rewarding when you go to a place you haven't been for a while that knows you, but, but you've put a record out in the meantime and then they listen to the record and then you go play the new songs and, and they know them. That's always satisfying. I, I did read somewhere. You don't, you don't have a set list. You don't use a set list anymore. Yeah, that's right. Do most, do most people, most bands do that after they get, do you just kind of, you just kind of fill the room? Yeah. Most yeah. people use that list. There's a few reasons. Like we, since we have so many albums, all of us would be bored if we played the same set every night. So uh -huh. me and the guys prefer it that way. And I've developed, it's interesting. I've developed a bunch of hand signals to tell them what, and most people probably don't notice, but because <laughs> Because the thing is, like, if I start the song, you, we can play four, four hundred. You don't want to have a bunch of breaks, right? Yeah. So you want it to be smooth. And so, if I start the song, then I'll just start playing the next song. But often, it's like the drummer has to count it in, and we all start together. So everyone has to know what the next song is. So, so towards the end of the current song, I'll give like a signal, like you know, or like like this, or I've got a bunch of, and then and then they'll know what's next, and then they'll just start the song. And it seems like we have a set list because there's no break. Ah, that's awesome. And then I have a set. I had a. I have a set of sub, sub signal signals for the guitar player Grant because he plays about four or five instruments. So before I tell him the song, I've got different hand signals for guitar or steel guitar or mandolin or whatever. You're like a third. You're like a third bass coach. Totally. Yeah. I didn't. Want, <laughs> I didn't want to say it to you because you're in that business and I probably sound like a dickhead. I usually. Oh, no. I usually say, yeah, I got, I got baseball hand signals for that stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. I want to know what's the signal for Bible on the dash. <laughs> I had a feeling that was what it was. Yeah. Actually it's changed over time. It used to be that, but now it's like this, like, like a Bible. <coughs> Do you keep yeah. a Bible on your dash? How's around. <laughs> around. Yeah, we do. We actually do out of just out of, uh, I don't know. Novelty honor the song we also have a book of mormon in case we're in utah <laughs> <laughs> that's great oh that's cool man well um tell me this do you, do you have time to play a song to close it out yeah sure you do before you do though corb where um i know you got the, the album out agricultural tragic that released yeah. this summer where can people find you where can they find your music when are you going to be playing live again i'm not sure about live hopefully soon it depends on the plague, <laughs> but uh, we're everywhere. We're on Spotify and iTunes and, and uh, um, YouTube and Instagram and we're all over the place. It's all just under Core Blonde. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. It's not gonna sound awesome because I don't have good microphones, but whatever. I was on it, you were asking about uh, Turnpike. I was on a elk hunting trip with Evan, the singer, two yeah. years ago in Idaho and um, I wrote this song about the trip because our buddy was our kind of our guy, unofficial guide. He's from Idaho, and he's he's in his late fifties. He's a retired uh, army ranger instructor, so super capable guy, right? Yeah. And so um, we were way up in the mountains in Idaho, like twenty miles in on a with a pack a pack string. And um, about day number eight, you know, we usually ride out five in the morning, ride out a couple miles, tie up the horses and the mules, go hunt all day, come back. Near the end of the trip, we hadn't found any elk yet. It was too early. And about day eight or nine, we came back and all the mules except one were gone and the, and the mare was gone. And there was no broken leads. And we all know how to tie up animals. So we don't know. We still know it'll be a mystery forever. But they were, they were pretty sure they were untied by somebody because there was no, we saw the lead. There was no broken leads and they, you could see them dragging it in the dust, right? So yeah. Uh, we tracked, we were trying to track them. The last two days of the hunt, we were looking for the mules and the, the horse instead of elk. So the whole time, and, and, and the guy, our buddy, the ranger guy, he, previous to this, told us all these crazy stories about some of the run-ins he'd have with cops since he'd been home. And so he's just kind of, he's a great guy. Love him to death. He's, he's better off in the woods, you know, that kind of a guy. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so we're looking for these, Mules and, and he's he's muttering the whole time about how great it's going to be to find these guys who stole his mules so we can 
bury him in the woods and stuff. And we're like, <laughs> me and Evan are like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hard to know how serious to take him, huh? So so eventually, in my polite Canadian way, I, I, I stopped him on the trail and said, Kurt, I need 90 seconds of your time here because I got to make sure we're not actually killing anybody because I don't want to. I don't think I'm down with being an accessory to murder. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, oh, it's okay. We'll just shoot him in the leg. So <laughs> the tune is about that, about him. So did you, did you ride it on that trip or did you ride it when you, you got back? A year later. Yeah. Really? Yeah. See, that's one of those things where I knew something was going to come out of that, but, but I didn't know what. And then eventually it just kind of came to me. And that's often how it happens. It has to percolate for a while, you know? Yeah. 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 You're a shot at it. Well, it's hard not to take your point, because, yeah, okay, fine. How do three mules and a mare just to come untied? Snake River horse thieving ain't quite gone out of style. So it's hard not to take your point, because, yeah, okay, fine. With that big 44 and killing on your mind, all I'm gonna ask for me, brothers, now the seconds of your time. And maybe try to change your mind, buddy. Don't wanna see you get your hands bloody. Here at home in peacetime. We both know you're better off in them out of whole hills. Where you can be alone with your thoughts and unconfirmed kills. The docs at the VA always be a pushing them pills. But we both know that all you need is them out of whole hills. With that big 44 and killing on your mind, all I'm gonna ask for me, brothers, now the seconds of your time. I never try to change your mind, buddy. Don't wanna see you get your hands bloody. Here at home, peace time. You think you got a minute and a half to listen to a friend? Cause I said we go hunt elk, we got tags for them. Well, let's take a minute and a half and just recognize decisions that affect your life and possibly mine. Why is everybody so surprised you train up a ranger? You use him up, cut him loose, he goes home, he radiates danger. All the folks that he knows in town treat him like a stranger. Why act so surprised he's an army ranger? With that big 44 and killing on your mind, all I'm gonna ask from your brother's nine seconds of your time. And maybe try to change your mind, Curtis. Don't wanna see you get your hands dirty. Here at home in peacetime, out here in peacetime. Something like that. Hell yeah, dude. I love it. I love it. Have you heard that one? Oh, fuck yeah. Yeah, I've heard it. That's one of my faves on the new record. Yeah. I told you, Buster and I, we got, we were coming back from a wedding and like we sat in the parking lot and listened to half that album at like midnight. Yeah. 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 He told me that story, man. I, uh, I enjoyed the hell out of it. Well, Corb, my friend, I appreciate your time. I look forward yeah. to, to you getting back out on the road and, um, Again, uh, I'm just grateful for your time. You know, I know time is our most valuable asset. So for you to share it with me, I appreciate it. Yeah, man, that was a lot of fun. It was interesting. I got to talk about stuff I don't always get to talk about. So, Good deal. It, it resonated, man. I know a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this. And it, and it hit me. You know, it resonated with me a lot. So it was cool to hear. I, I know that was just a part of your story, but it was really cool to hear it. Cool. That was a lot of fun, man. Thanks for having me. I look forward to uh, getting this thing out so everybody else can hear it. Right on. All right, brother. Have yeah. a good one.